Chapter 411 Syra. Anticipation hung in the air as the dragon siblings awaited the arrival of the mysterious bard. Sidis had strategically positioned himself in the shadows, ready to gauge the situation from a concealed vantage point. Imi stood at the forefront, flanked by Enos and Brita, with Essie positioned further back. The cave seemed to buzz with a sense of unease, the siblings exchanging nervous glances. Their wait was mercifully short-lived, the cave echoing with the approach of footsteps. Lana and Halbier soon emerged, leading a diminutive yet attractive human lady. The bard's hourglass figure drew immediate attention, and Emmy, sensitive to auras, detected a commanding presence emanating from the seemingly petite stranger. With brown hair adorned with magenta tips, bright electric blue eyes, and lighter complexion skin, the newcomer's appearance was both captivating and enigmatic. Emmy and her siblings observed the bard's every move as she approached, clad in black leather armor with a lute on her back and a flute at her belt. Twin blades crossed on her back completed her ensemble. The small woman walked over with a seemingly carefree demeanor, her aura exuding a blend of mischief and confidence. Once she stood before them, the stranger broke the silence with a gentle smile and a wave. Aren't you all just the adorable bunch? Emmy, caught off guard by the unexpected compliment, stammered, A adorable? The bard chuckled. Why, of course, so young, cute, and oh so full of energy. Makes me want to squeeze you. Her light-hearted laughter resonated through the cave. Essie, who had been observing from a distance, couldn't resist stepping a bit closer. There was something about the newcomer that reminded her of her own grandmother. Collecting herself, Emmy pressed for answers. Who are you? And what are you doing here? The bard shook her head, maintaining her gentle smile. First of all, it's bad manners to stay hidden and spy on others. Abruptly, she turned her gaze towards the right, where Sidis, who had been concealed in the shadows, now stood in dumbfounded surprise. That's more like it, she said with a nod of approval. Come on, dear. I doubt you can't recognize your own kin, she added, mischief dancing in her eyes. A dragoness? Emmy questioned hesitantly, still uncertain about the true nature of the enigmatic visitor. The strength that radiated from her was undeniable, and if her claim held true, her mastery over her powers was truly commendable. Essie, breaking her silence, transformed back into her human form. The bard, seeing this, expressed a mild surprise. Oh, excuse me, are you perhaps Grandma Sila? Essie inquired tentatively. The bard's eyes widened in genuine surprise, and with a swift, almost magical movement, she disappeared and reappeared before Essie. The dragon siblings, ready to react defensively, found themselves frozen in disbelief as they watched the stranger extend a hand toward Essie. Just as despair began to cloud Emmy's face, the scene took an unexpected turn. The bard's expression shifted, and before anyone could comprehend what was happening, Essie found herself engulfed in a warm, tight hug. The satisfaction on the bard's face was unmistakable. How cute! What did you call me? Grandma? Come on, say it again. Yes, yes, I'm your grandma, Sila, the bard exclaimed, reveling in the endearing title as Essie stood embraced in her unexpected grandmother's arms. The cave, once tense with uncertainty, now resonated with warmth. The atmosphere in the cave shifted from tension to a more relaxed setting as Sila, the unexpected grandmother, engaged the group in conversation. Seated together, the rhythmic tapping of Sila's fingers on the ground created a soothing backdrop to the unfolding dialogue. So, you ran away? Sila inquired, her gaze moving across the faces of the dragon siblings. In an unspoken acknowledgement of their actions, all the siblings, save for Brita, lowered their heads in a shared moment of shame. Sila, recognizing the weight of their decision, reassured them, Oh dear, I don't mean to reprimand you. Quite the opposite. That was a smart decision. There's no point in losing your life to a meaningless conflict. You are too young for that. She mumbled the last part to herself, a testament to her wisdom gained through the ages. Essie, unable to contain her curiosity, ventured a question. Excuse me, how do you know grandmother? Sila, seemingly surprised, pulled down her lute and inquired. Oh, didn't she already tell you about me? Shaking her head, Essie shared. She mentioned you a few times and said that your transformation art was on par with hers, but she never talked about the details, 
hesitating for a moment. With a gentle pat on Essie's head, Silas sighed and suggested, How about I tell you a little story? Essie's eyes sparkled with excitement as she eagerly nodded in agreement. Sila, with a hearty laugh, turned to the others and posed a question. What about the rest of you? We would be honored, Emmy replied respectfully. Sila, dismissing the formalities, lightened the mood with a wink and remarked, Oh, dear, no need for the stiff formality. Just call me Grandma Sila, or better yet, Big Sister. Her playful demeanor hinted at the depth of the connection she shared with the dragon siblings, bridging the gap between generations with ease. Well, here goes, she said, her hand on her lute as she began to play a gentle melody. In the aftermath of battle, where silence reigned supreme, two dragonness, survivors lone, in the moonlit gleam, comrades lost, a somber air, their wings worn and scarred, yet fate had intertwined their tales, friendship unmarred. Through the echoes of the fallen, a bond began to grow, two steadfast hearts, side by side, Against the ebbing woat on wings of camaraderie, through trials they did roam in the shadows of the battlefield. A friendship found its home. Beneath the stars' quiet gaze, stories shared like ancient lore, two kindred spirits, battle weary, yet their spirits soared with scales marked by war's cruel touch. A tale of resilience, facing the unknown hand in hand, in steadfast alliance. Through the echoes of the fallen, a bond began to grow, two steadfast hearts, side by side, against the ebbing woat on wings of camaraderie. Through trials they did roam in the shadows of the battlefield. A friendship found its home. In the quiet moments of the night, beneath the watchful moon, a pact unspoken bound their souls. A kinship to a tune, through untamed realms and endless skies. Their journey wide, a friendship forged in battle's wake, standing side by side. Homeward bound, the dragon's sword, tales etched upon the wind, a chronicle of friendship strong, where destinies did blend through ancient realms and shadowed skies. Their saga brightly told, two dragonness, steadfast friends, their bond a treasure to hold. Through the echoes of the fallen, a bond began to grow, two steadfast hearts, side by side, against the ebbing woat on wings of camaraderie. Through trials they did roam in the shadows of the battlefield. A friendship found its home. Chapter 412 New Forms As Syrah's captivating voice reverberated through the cave, weaving tales of battles long past, the dragon siblings found themselves drawn into the tapestry of her memories. Once the story concluded, a brief yet profound silence enveloped the cave, as if the very walls were absorbing the echoes of history. Well now, don't just stand there with your mouths open. You're making me self-conscious, Syra teased, injecting a playful tone into the moment. T, that was amazing, Essie exclaimed, unable to contain her awe. Her eyes sparkled with admiration as she continued. Your voice was so pretty. Syra, delighted by Essie's enthusiasm, responded with a warm smile. Oh dear, aren't you just the cutest? Gently patting Essie's head with a grand motherly affection that transcended generations. Sidis, usually reserved, cautiously joined the conversation, asking, So you've met grandmother on a battlefield? Syra's gaze met his, the smile lingering as she nodded. Yes, but that was a very, very long time ago. Enos, his curiosity peaked, interjected. Was it against the shades? A solemn tone crept into Syra's response. Shades? Heh, no, it wasn't. The revelation left the siblings exchanging puzzled glances, Sensing the weight behind Syrah's words, deciding not to press further, they respected her unspoken desire to keep certain memories veiled. As Syrah absent mindedly played a gentle tune on her lute, her gaze fixated on the cave's ceiling. The group fell into a contemplative hush. Uncertain how to approach the moment, they found themselves caught between curiosity and the unspoken understanding that some chapters were best left closed. Breaking the silence, Brita took a step forward her goddessly grace evident as she addressed Syra. Excuse me. Syra lowered her eyes to meet Brita's gaze, a playful twinkle in her eyes. Oh, it's the cute goddess child. What is it, dear? Startled by the endearment, Brita momentarily hesitated before gathering her composure and inquiring. May I ask, what is your plan now? Hmm, my plan. That's a good question, Syra mused. 
her eyes shifting toward the siblings standing in the background. Well, first things first, why not come back with me? If your objective was to hide and lay low, I think it would be better to come with me for that. Brita turned to the others, her expression questioning. Unsurprisingly, Enos, typically straightforward, spoke up. Do you have an invisibility spell? Or something similar to hide us? His curiosity gleamed in his eyes. Haha. Oh, but I have something much more fun. Syra declared with a mischievous grin, sending an inexplicable chill down their spines. The air buzzed with anticipation. No, I refuse. I can't do this. Sidis's voice resounded through the cave, his protest echoing the sentiment of many reluctant dragons forced into human forms. But you look so adorable. Syra's whimsical response only intensified the atmosphere of protest. Enos, adding his voice to the rebellion, declared, No, this is humiliation. I agree with Sidis. The cave bore witness to the sound of crashing as Enos grappled with the unfamiliarity of a human physique. Amidst the spectacle, Lana, John, and the other disciples exchanged bemused glances. The mighty dragons, now confined to human forms, struggled with the most basic of movements, an ironic sight considering the formidable beings they truly were. The absurdity of the scene would have been comical if not for the lingering memory of the dragon's true, awe-inspiring forms. Essie, reveling in her siblings' struggles, hopped along with a joyous expression, her infectious giggles resonating throughout the cave as she offered playful pointers. Sidis, transformed into a young man with rich, ebony skin, embodied strength and resilience. His finely sculpted features and mysterious, deep-set eyes exuded an untamed spirit. Though he complained and wrestled with the challenge of maintaining balance, a quiet confidence betrayed his inherent strength. His lean physique emitted a captivating aura, a stark contrast to the imposing dragon he once was. On the other hand, Enos, with wild and untamed golden hair, showcased his towering presence as the tallest among them. His muscular frame, seemingly sculpted to perfection, was a testament to his physical prowess. Despite his frown, he continued poking away at his muscles with his newfound fingers. His powerful figure held an undeniable allure. Emmy, distinct from the others, chose a more measured approach to adapting to her human appearance. Her long, silky silver hair cascaded gracefully, framing a face adorned with flawless milky-white skin and captivating red eyes. The elegance of her figure and the fascination she displayed with her hair and fingers added an ethereal charm to her newfound form. As the dragons navigated the challenges of their human guises, the cave witnessed a curious fusion of absurdity and charm, a testament to the adaptability of these mighty beings forced into the realms of human experience. Are you sure this is going to work? Brita inquired. Her tone laced with concern as she observed the dragons grappling with their unfamiliar human forms. Syra, ever confident, responded with a reassuring smile. Oh, it will. Look at them now. Their aura is already almost non-existent. This would work better than any disguise. Not to mention, shades, not even dragons, would easily tell the difference from afar. Brita turned her gaze towards Syra her eyes reflecting a mix of confusion and curiosity. Sensing the unspoken questions, Syra encouraged. Just ask what you wish to know, dear. The hesitation lingered in Brita's expression as she ventured. Why are you here? I mean, why are you in the... In the mortal realm, Syra finished the question with a knowing smile. Brita nodded, her uncertainty evident. Yes. A short sigh escaped Syra's lips before she responded. It's simple, really. I've also run away. The only difference is that I did it a long time ago. I see. Brita acknowledged with a hesitant nod before turning her gaze back to the siblings. The dragons, in their own time, were slowly but surely acclimating to their new and unfamiliar human forms, the cave witnessing a peculiar yet fascinating transformation. Far away, on a distant planet, ravaged by the aftermath of a massive battle, I materialized in the skies. A frown adorned my face as I surveyed the desolation below. It was yet another dead world, a somber testament to the relentless waves of conflict that had swept through its once vibrant landscapes. I was too late again. I murmured with a heavy heart as I slowly descended to the barren ground. 
The remnants of life on this desolate planet were almost non-existent. The mana that once flowed through it shattered and distorted. The colossal corpses of fallen gods and dragons lay strewn across the landscape, silent witnesses to the cataclysmic clash that had unfolded. Isn't this simply mutual destruction? I pondered aloud, grappling with the weight of the scenes before me. The consequences of the cosmic turmoil were starkly evident, rendering the once thriving world into a lifeless tableau of ruin. My gaze lingered on the shattered remnants of what was once a vibrant ecosystem. The air, thick with the stench of decay, echoed the tragic tale of battles fought and lost. A sense of melancholy enveloped me as I contemplated the cost of such cosmic conflicts, leaving worlds scarred and devoid of vitality. With a heavy heart, I sighed and vanished, leaving behind the desolation that spoke volumes about the cyclical nature of cosmic struggles and the toll they exacted on the very fabric of existence. Chapter 413 Pillars and Elements Since my transformative experience, my perception has undergone a rapid evolution, granting me the ability to discern hidden elements previously hidden from my awareness. This newfound insight extended to the complex workings of teleportation, a cosmic dance where I could visualize and feel my transition from the material realm to the astral plane, ultimately materializing in distant locations. The cosmic mana, a potent force as it is, served as my guide, facilitating the manipulation of space within the astral plane. This process, which was akin to navigating a cosmic shortcut, became increasingly seamless with my growing familiarity and expertise in handling the cosmic mana. Multiple excursions through the astral plane ensued, revealing its ethereal surprises before I reluctantly withdrew. However, it was on a certain occasion that a heightened sensitivity accompanied my enhanced senses, which led me to detect an ominous undercurrent the moment I stepped into the astral plane. Unlike my previous encounters, this disquieting sensation permeated my entire being. My scales tingled, and my senses emitted persistent warning signals. An indistinct yet palpable danger lurked within the astral plane, elusive in its exact location but undeniable in its unsettling presence. Initially confusing, this unnerving feeling dissipated immediately upon my return to the material realm, leaving me grappling with the mysteries I was still unaware of in the astral plane. Curiosity and a desire for understanding compelled me to test the boundaries further, re-entering the astral plane only to find the unease resurface. Pushing back my adventurous spirit, I chose to forego tempting fate and pressed on with my cosmic journey, leaving the enigmatic astral realm behind. Unearthing whatever caused that feeling would come later, now, however, was not the time. Guided by the radiant beacon of cosmic mana, I traced its luminous trail through the cosmic expanse, following it back home. My current location found me deep into the heart of shade territory, a situation that unnerved me but also piqued my surprise and curiosity. Contrary to my expectations, not all planets within this shadowy domain appeared overtaken by the shades. Some harbored mortal beings and an array of creatures, united by a peculiar commonality, the conspicuous absence of mana. In the back of my mind, I mused inwardly, questioning whether this lack of mana was the reason why the Shades refrained from asserting dominion over these particular realms. As I approached a particular small solar system, a celestial ballet unfolded before me. A lone blue planet, adorned with a resplendent planetary ring, basked in the ethereal glow cast by a distant sun. My insatiable curiosity beckoned compelling me to draw near and explore the enigmatic allure of this cosmic gem. Drawn by the gravitational embrace, I initiated a graceful descent, teleporting myself through the cosmic tapestry directly into the skies above the tantalizing world. Blinking away the disorientation, my eyes swiftly adapted to the unfamiliar pull of gravity as I surveyed the panorama that unfolded beneath me. A vast expanse of ocean stretched out, uninterrupted by the presence of land. Faint echoes of mortal existence resonated through the cosmic currents, their dispersed forms dotting the watery canvas below. Driven by an inquisition inquisitive spirit, I descended, my draconic claws gently grazing the water's surface. A genuine smile adorned my otherworldly visage, an acknowledgement of the comforting familiarity even in this unfamiliar cosmic realm. 
The absence of elemental mana didn't diminish the joy of being in proximity to the water. A sentiment of longing for the embrace of aqueous realms tugged at my very being. Pondering the curious puzzle, I scratched my head mid-flight. The absence of mana in a world dominated by a colossal ocean perplexed my mind. Back in the main plane, mana flowed seamlessly from the mana stream, carrying the essence of all elements across the plane. Some of the other worlds exhibited variations, some lacked a mana stream, while others embraced the omnipresence of mana without a discernible pattern. This particular world presented yet another anomaly. With the vastness of the ocean, one would anticipate the omnipresent presence of water mana. Yet, a profound emptiness echoed through the cosmic currents. Questions reverberated through my consciousness, an enigmatic chorus demanding answers. Lost in contemplation, my leisurely flight led me to the unexpected sight of a sprawling fleet of wooden ships, interlinked to create what seemed to be an artificial island. Mortal ingenuity manifested amidst this peculiar plane, prompting further queries in my mind. How did the absence of mana affect the mortals in this world? What other differences were there between this realm and others that had it? And most importantly, why did it not have any mana? Each question tugged at my brain, urging me to unravel the secrets embedded within this place. As I ascended into the sky, veiled by the concealing embrace of clouds, the oblivious mortals below remained unaware of my ethereal presence. Though unseen by them, my enhanced vision allowed me an unobstructed view of their humanoid forms. A distinctive feature, however, caught my attention. Their skin possessed a subtle azure hue, accompanied by inconspicuous gills adorning their necks. Their noses, curiously diminutive, marked a departure from the human norm, rendering them distinctly unique, yet eerily familiar. Despite these peculiarities, their bodies, much like those of humans, lacked any discernible trace of mana. The persistent question echoed within my cosmic consciousness. Where does mana truly originate? This enigma lingered in my thoughts as I soared through the skies, my form hidden behind the protective shroud of clouds. Observing the azure-skinned inhabitants, I couldn't help but marvel at the divergence in their physiology. Almost human, yet intricately distinct, they stood as a testament to the diversity that unfolded below. With a final glance, I left them behind, my silhouette vanishing into the celestial canvas. Returning to the cosmic expanse beyond the confines of the planet, I reappeared amidst the boundless sea of stars and cosmos, a tapestry that illuminated the vastness of space. Reflecting on the presence of mana, my musings spilled into a murmured dialogue with myself. The only mana within space is cosmic mana. No, perhaps other pillars contribute as well? The mysteries persisted, urging me to delve deeper into the currents that intertwined with the fabric of the universe, seeking answers in the limitless expanse that stretched beyond the boundaries of this peculiar world. I can't feel the presence of any of the other pillars, not even the darkness pillar, but I think it should be out here. I cast one final glance at the blue planar before I left. Then, if the pillars can be found everywhere, even in space, what about the elemental mana? I wondered as I continued my journey. Chapter 414 Answers Continuing my quest for answers, my journey unfolded with the discovery of two more planets barren of mana and devoid of the presence of shades. My curiosity deepened, pondering the origin of elemental mana that seemed conspicuously absent in these distant realms. I mused over the notion that mana was intertwined with the very pillars of existence, which were omnipresent even in the cosmic vastness of space. The absence of elemental mana led me to contemplate its source. Where did it originate, and was there something overlooked in my observations? The prospect of uncovering hidden truths fueled my eagerness as I pressed forward, determined to leave the Shade's territory behind and unravel the questions I had at hand. Since elemental mana wasn't present everywhere and it wasn't present in space, then that must mean it comes from a certain source. Now the question was, where exactly? Somewhere I didn't see before? Thinking about all of that made me look forward to coming across a world with mana. Swiftly navigating through space, I carefully avoided worlds tainted by the shades, opting instead for unexplored territories. Surprisingly, my voyage remained relatively smooth, a testament to my strategic choices amid the ongoing war and ever-shifting borders. 
In turn, it didn't take me long before I found myself back to what I assumed was dragon territory. The landscape was marred by battles and conflict. While I refrained from interference in seemingly controlled skirmishes, my thoughts fixated on a singular question. The origin of elemental mana. Initially, I assumed that specific elements gave rise to corresponding mana, fire begetting fire mana, and water yielding water mana. Yet, the mana-less world shattered this simplistic belief. Driven by an insatiable curiosity, I set out to find the source. I didn't know why, but my curiosity had gotten the best of me, and since I was on my way back home anyway, then it shouldn't matter much. Finding a world with mana in our territory was surprisingly easy. It only took a few dozen teleportations before I found myself floating in front of a medium-sized planet. Teleporting directly into this realm, I was greeted by the sight of an expansive mountain range and a vast valley. I scanned the surroundings, my senses attuned to the elements. Earth mana permeated the environment, yet, to my dismay, I realized I no longer held the ability to command it. Closing my eyes, a wistful smile played upon my lips as I shook my head in acknowledgement. Though I could perceive and interact with the elements, the mastery I once possessed had dissipated. The journey, now intertwined with nostalgia and the pursuit of understanding, continued with a newfound purpose. That's a strange feeling, I sighed. Sensing the elements around me acknowledging my presence, a bittersweet realization washed over me. I could feel their essence but lacked the ability to shape even the simplest earth spike. I guess you never appreciate what you have until you lose it, I sighed. The weight of my newfound limitations settling in as I began to stroll around the peak of the mountain. Initially, my observations focused on the ebb and flow of mana in this peculiar world. Unlike the mana-less realms, there was no distinct mana stream here. Yet mana permeated the environment. Curiosity sparked within me. What set this world apart from those devoid of mana? In a whimsical attempt to glean insights, I engaged in a one-sided conversation with an earth element floating near my claw, a hopeful smile on my face. Any chance you would tell me where you came from? Unsurprisingly, silence met my inquiry. Undeterred, I continued to observe the small, seemingly adorable elemental being when something unexpected suddenly happened. It vanished from my sight. Perplexed, I scanned the surroundings. The earth element I had been watching had disappeared, leaving behind only its counterparts. Wait, what? I muttered, puzzled by the sudden disappearance. However, upon closer inspection, I noticed a faint strand of cosmic mana materializing in the space the element once occupied. No, it didn't disappear. Examining my open claw, I marveled as another almost imperceptible strand of cosmic mana appeared. What is cosmic mana doing here? I questioned the cosmic forces that seemed to be interwoven with the more familiar elemental energies. Refocusing my attention on the remaining earth elements, I randomly selected another to observe. True to the pattern, after a few minutes, it too vanished, accompanied by the subtle trace of cosmic mana. The phenomenon was nuanced, almost escaping notice. Had I not been paying attention, I would have most certainly missed it. Just to be sure, I continued my observation for a few more minutes before I finally came to the conclusion. The elements were being teleported somewhere. Not only that, they were also being teleported here from somewhere. With that out of the way, it was only a matter of finding out where. So, I picked an unsuspecting earth element and used my connection to the cosmic mana to cast a faint link to it. It wasn't much, but it should be enough to allow me to track the element. After that, it was only a matter of waiting. Thankfully, I didn't have to wait for long as the element disappeared right before me. I kept tabs on it using the link of cosmic mana before a frown made its way across my face. Astral plane? The link that connected me to the element shattered shortly afterward, but it didn't matter since I already found what I was looking for. The elements come from the astral plane? I scratched my head in confusion. Do they? My memories of the astral plane were not the best. My first time accidentally visiting the place was far from ideal after all, but now things were different. I was different. Still, maybe I should wait until I have more information. I spoke to myself. There was still that prickly feeling that made my scales stand on edge every time I stepped onto the astral plane. Not to mention, I don't really understand what kind of place it is, exactly. I need to ask grandma, shaking my head. 
I shot off the mountain peak and into the sky, teleporting outside of the planet and into the comfortable embrace of space. Well, at least I figured out where elemental mana is coming from, I think. Now it's just a matter of finding out what exactly is the astral plane. Chapter 415. In Goal. It's the Void Walker. Hold the line. Hold the line. Push them back. Cries and roars echoed through the skies as I emerged above another battlefield. Most of those present recognized me almost immediately, and triumphant cheers followed right after. My body constantly teleported as I unleashed my dragon breath on the horde of shades, gods, and even dragons. It was a surreal sight, one that I would have never imagined before. Shades fighting alongside dragons, how absurd. I was already close to the main world, and the war was raging across every plane. Everything was burning, planets had collapsed, and gods, dragons, and shades alike fell by the dozen. No matter how much I wished to rush back, it was hard to ignore the fights raging before me. To make things worse, some of the high-ranking shades, dragons, and even deities had some way or another of holding back my teleportation attacks. It was making it harder for me to take care of all of them at once. And so, I was forced to engage directly. My body constantly flashed across the skies and the land as I bit, tore, and killed anyone who stood in my way. I avoided an attack from a deity as I flew overhead, only to get knocked to the ground by a massive silver dragon. Dust rose as the dragon sent enormous sharp silver pillars aimed at my head. I was about to teleport away when the deity that had launched her earlier sneak attack on me jumped on my back with a crazed expression. Faced with the silver dragon's attack, I momentarily ignored the deity that was stabbing her sword into my back and unleashing her divinity, and instead teleported away. I didn't cover her with my cosmic mana, so her teleportation alongside me was not safe, to say the least. I reappeared behind the silver dragon, my claws launching for the back of its neck. The deity that was latched onto my back was no longer there. Only her hands grasping the sword still stuck in my back were left. The silver dragon tried to fight back, but I pierced its back with my lower claws and used my tail to prevent it from moving before my jaw clasped around its neck, decapitating its head and ending its life. The blood tasted disgusting to me, but I had no time to think about anything as a swarm of shades rushed toward me. A wave of my cosmic mana was enough to make them disappear, but more soon followed. A particular monster in the midst of the swarm had a dark fog that swirled ominously around them. Seeing that, a frown made its way across my face. The fog was interfering with teleportation. I could teleport myself, but not them. Ah, this is annoying, I cursed. Follow the void walker. More cries echoed around me as a group of gods suddenly gathered around me forming a small army with me at the center. We'll take care of the small fry and clear the way for you, said a glowing god. His features were hard to make out due to the blinding light surrounding his body, but I still nodded nonetheless. With that, the squad of gods, led by the brightly shining one, rushed forward with a renewed sense of purpose. They carved their way through the enemies with efficiency, showing no mercy to whoever stood in their way. The shades fell by the dozen, and an occasional god and dragon died as well. I wasn't idle. Instead, I teleported myself directly toward my opponent. The being had no eyes. Instead, his dark horns extended from his forehead and curled backward. He had two long limbs that ended with sharp claws, while his lower half was hidden behind the fog. I didn't hesitate. The second I reappeared behind the beast, he instantly turned his head toward me. His lack of features except for his mouth was eerie, but I had no time to think of such a thing. I avoided the blast of red energy that the being launched at me and watched as the swarm of shades behind disintegrated under it before I held the monster by his horns and used my back limbs to push him back. I tried to use my cosmic mana, but the dark fog seemed to read my intention, constantly interfering with me and protecting its master. I could teleport myself away, but that wouldn't do much good in the current situation. We both fell to the ground causing it to shake, and I used my teeth to aim for the monster's neck. His scales were harder than I expected, and I wasn't able to do much damage. I was then pushed back and sent crashing to the ground, but my right claw was still firmly grasping the monster's horn. It roared and used its fog-coated claw to slash at me. I expertly avoided his strikes and used its horn to keep his head pointed downwards. 
Once the monster grew frustrated, another roar escaped his mouth, and I could see the red energy beam forming around his open maw. Not wasting any more time, I used all my strength to push the bastard on his back, and my claws to hold his head steady as I unleashed my dragon breath right at its open mouth and still forming energy beam. The world instantly went white, and I hastily teleported away to watch my handiwork. The monster exploded, and the fog disappeared alongside it. A small cosmic shield materialized before me to protect me from the small debris and attacks. Well, that's one bastard down, I said under my breath as I scanned the battlefield. The group of deities was swiftly taking care of the remains of the Shade Swarm while chanting my name. Void Walker. Hail the Void Walker. Such loud cries were easy to make out, even amidst the chaos of the battlefield, and I would be lying if I said it didn't make me feel good. Still, I couldn't afford to dwell on my feelings of satisfaction. There was still a battle to be won. The current world was already a dead one in my eyes. The damage it received was extensive. Sure, it was still holding on, albeit barely, but the native mortals had already gone extinct, and the plane was hell on earth. Seeing all that, I was once again pushed into thinking about just what it was that we were fighting for. Amidst all the deaths, destruction, and chaos, I had lost sight of the end goal. Chapter 416 Journey Down the Mountain So where are we going, Grandma Syrah? Essie asked as she hopped alongside the bar dragoness. Syrah gave her a warm smile in response and patted her head affectionately before answering, as I've said, the real mortal realm. Oh, but why can't we just fly there? Puzzled Essie asked before adding, Brother Sidis can hide our tracks very well. That, I'm sure he can. But, Syra paused and turned to look behind her, where the group of three dragons were struggling to walk in a normal line. They still need time to get used to their bodies. Seeing that, Essie giggled and nodded in agreement. Sister Emmy is already starting to get the hang of it, she said. The white dragoness was indeed walking somewhat normally compared to her siblings. Sidis had a bit more trouble compared to her, but the worst of them all was Enos. He could barely walk a couple of steps before tumbling down to the ground, followed by a string of curses. I hate this. Why must I degrade myself to this inferior form? His arms flailed about as he stood up, only to fall once more. In a fit of rage, he clenched his fist and hit the ground leaving behind a small crater, but causing both Sidis and Emmy to fall down. Damn it, Enos. I was just getting the hang of it. Sidis by his side barred his teeth in annoyance, while Emmy simply rolled her eyes with a sigh. Brita followed along behind them, with a faint, almost untraceable smile on her face. If Ether was here, he'd be able to tell that she was very much amused by the whole scene unfolding before her. At this rate, we might never leave this mountain. Emmy sighed one more time and muttered under her breath. Oh please, like you are any better. I can see your legs trembling, Sidis said with a glare. At least I can walk without kissing the ground every three steps, she shot back. That's Enos. I can walk just fine, Sidis answered with a glare. What did I do? Enos asked from behind only to be met with a glare from both of them. Shut up. They both replied simultaneously before almost tumbling to the ground once more. Damn it, this is not working well. How humiliating. Sidis cursed before turning to his sister. Although he hated to admit it, she was indeed one step better at adapting to this flimsy body than he was. Swallowing back his pride, he spoke to her. I call for a momentary truce. Surprised, Emmy raised her brow in a very humane expression. Oh? As much as I hate to admit it, this is only wasting our time. As support me from my left, and I'll do it from your right. He stuttered as he extended his hand. Emmy glanced at it, and then back at him before silently taking his hand. They both placed their arms on each other's shoulders and began to walk slowly side by side, their steps gaining more momentum and more confidence as they went. Hey wait, wait, what about me? Enos cried out from behind as the duo slowly left him. Damn it, that's not fair. He cursed and turned his head, his eyes meeting with Brita's almost emotionless face. A wide grin made its way across his face as he shyly extended his hand toward her. Help. Shaking her head, Brita silently grabbed his shoulder and dragged him along. Wait, wait. Slow down. I'm going to fall again, wait. 
Enos's cries echoed throughout the mountain range as the group slowly descended from the peak, leaving behind a group of anxious disciples who still had a hard time understanding what had just happened. We'll camp here for the night, Cyrus said as the group reached a green valley in the middle of the mountain range. Oh why, I can finally walk now, Enos said by her side. Sidis and Immy were standing in two opposite directions, refusing to acknowledge one another, while Essie was glancing at their surroundings in curiosity. It's too late and too dark. It's best to get some rest, Cyrus said as she began to set camp. Too dark, confused, Enos turned to look at the group, and Brita simply shrugged. But, we can still see? He asked again. Syria chuckled as she sat down around a fire that she somehow managed to make almost instantly. She patted the ground beside her and spoke, Yes, you can, my child. But for now, you are a human. And humans take rests at night. And they cannot see when it's too dark. But I'm a dragon. Enos whispered to himself in confusion. She means we are pretending to be humans, so it's best if we act like ones. Essie whispered to him by his side. Ah. Enos nodded in understanding. Soon. The entire group was sitting around the fire, each lost in their own chain of thoughts. Why did you choose to stay in the mortal world, Grandma Syra? Essie suddenly asked. Syria, who was gently caressing her loot, replied, Well, dear, mortals can be quite fascinating at times. And I suppose I enjoy the tranquility of living there. Immy, who had been silent this whole time, finally spoke. Tranquility? I agree that mortals are intriguing. But aren't they also known for waging wars all the time? Just from the time I've spent here, I've seen all manners of politics and schemes. I'm not sure I would call it tranquil. Oh, you've spent some time here, you say? Syrah asked. Immy nodded and pointed back to the way they came from with her head. I've stayed at the church along with Brother Ether's disciples. Ether, huh? That's the child that's been going around making all that mess. Syra chuckled lightly. Still, her words caused a frown to make its way across Sidis's face. Well, dear, I'm not sure if we can call what you did, living amongst the mortals. Sure, you've stayed with them up there, but you were worshipped, akin to a god like the lass sitting over there. Brita pointed at herself in confusion at suddenly being called out. The thing is, to truly understand them, you must experience what it really means to be them, and that's by putting on this fake display. Sidis asked with a frown. Enos nodded by his side and added, We are no mortals. We are proud dragons. Another chuckle escaped Syra's mouth as she continued. No one said you weren't dear, but sometimes, it's good to know more about the world we inhabit. We share this entire place amongst each other. After all, she said as she raised her head to glance at the stars. Chapter 417 Hail the Voidwalker The main world? The god asked in a puzzled tone. His glowing outer appearance flickered as he walked beside me. We have had no contact ever since the attack on the council's plane, Voidwaller, he said with a shake of his head. The deity then turned his gaze upwards where a group of lesser gods were busy mending the broken space where a barrier once stood. Hurry up, you lazy bastards. The barrier isn't going to fix itself. Is there any point in doing this? I couldn't help but ask, my voice betraying my thoughts. Hmm, what do you mean? The deity asked as we continued to walk around the devastating aftermath of the battle. Dragons were tending to their wounds. Deities were gathering the fallen. With parties regrouping in preparation for the next attack. How many times have they raided this world? I asked. Too many to count. He shook his head. Everything is already dead. I continued. He nodded his head in acknowledgement. Indeed. The mortals are dead. The world itself is dead. I said hesitantly. That's true. The deity simply agreed with a nod. It was hard to get a read on his emotions with the bright light surrounding his body. So what is it that you are fighting for, exactly? I asked. The deity paused. His body was shorter than mine. It was considerably taller than a mere mortal, but still shorter than me. I could see his head turned upward as he faced me, and I could only assume he was staring right at me. Because this place is our home, he said as a matter of fact. His words caught me by surprise, and for a moment I didn't know what to say. It was a simple reply, really. Though, one I didn't expect. I thought he would say something about tit greater good. Something about fighting off the traitors. Your home. Huh. I muttered. Yes, our home. He continued with a nod. 
His head turned to the desolate landscape that stretched before us. I wasn't sure what this world looked like before, but for now, it was nothing but a ruin of death and destruction. And as long as we are still alive, then this place shall be as well, he continued in a low voice. You mean, you plan to rebuild this place? I asked. Haha, of course. His enthusiastic reply caused me to raise my brow in surprise. You are awfully optimistic about all of this, I said. Not everyone has the power to hop between worlds like you, Voidwalker, he said as we paused before a massive corpse of a fallen deity. For most of us, this place is all we've ever known. It's all we will ever know, he said and gently caressed the fallen body before us. I understand. Thank you for your help. We are forever indebted to you, Voidwalker. Should we survive this purge, this plane is forever at your service. He turned to me and gave me a bow. Please raise your head. We are all in this together, I said. If you are going back to the main world, you ought to be careful. Do you know something? I asked. As I've said, we've lost contact after the attack on the council. But the space around all the planes is in chaos. It's even worse than before. Now, it's hard to tell friends from foes. The deity shook his head. Got it. Well then, I'll be taking my leave. I spoke with a light sigh. The deity gave me a nod and turned his head to the sky. His voice suddenly boomed around the world catching me by surprise. Line up. At his words, the massive army of deities suddenly came together in a unified formation. The dragon stood up and glanced my way with approval. Hail the Void Walker. The glowing deity spoke first, and the massive army followed after. Hail the Void Walker. Their unified voices shook the heavens and caused the ground to tremble. The dragons raised their heads upwards and roared. Feelings of pride swelled inside of me at the sight of it all. I gave them one final nod before I summoned my cosmic mana and teleported away, leaving behind the ruined world along with its surviving inhabitants. Once I was out in space, I turned my gaze to glance at the planet I'd left behind. The barrier was slowly getting fixed, and I could sense the dragons and gods working together side by side in preparation for the next attack. Heh, so dragons and deities can get along after all. I inwardly chuckled. I then teleported once more and continued on my journey, following the faint tread of cosmic mana back home. Out here in the vast open space, I was at home. Ever since my body was reconstructed, I could feel the embrace of the cosmos as I swam through space. I took a moment to regain my bearings and doubled down on my teleportation, crossing large distances with each hop. Occasionally, I would come across faint lights in the distance, tell signs of battle, but I had wasted enough time. And so, I avoided all battlefields. A few times, I was ambushed by some shades, but thankfully, they were nothing much, and I was able to easily take care of them. I should be there soon. I inwardly thought as I closed in on the main world when suddenly I was forced out of my teleportation. Ah damn it, what is it this time? I cursed as I scanned my surroundings. It didn't take long to figure it out with the help of cosmic mana. Come out you bastard, I can see you. I instantly tried to lock space around a specific area when a strange figure countered my cosmic spell and walked out. That's dangerous. So young, and already so proficient in handling cosmic mana. This is why pillars are dangerous. The figure's voice spoke directly into my mind causing me to frown as I watched it walk through space as if it was on land. Who are you? I asked, but the figure did not reply. It was covered in the shade's signature dark fog, making it somewhat harder to see in space. Alas, with cosmic mana, it was as bright as the day before me. You are not leaving this place alive, little pillar. You've already caused us enough problems as it is. I've already died once. I'm not planning on doing that again anytime soon. Chapter 418 Cunning Look, I'm already there. Can't we just do this another day? I answered in a frustrated tone. The shade did not reply, and instead launched another attack forcing me to teleport away in a dodge. The dark fog was dangerous. Before it, the defensive properties of my scales were basically non-existent. I took a quick glance at my side and winced. A few of my scales were missing as the shade's energy was running rampant in my body, stopping me from fully healing myself. It was not impossible, but it was significantly harder to expel it when the damned bastard wouldn't give me a single moment to rest. Our bodies constantly flashed about in space with me doing most of the dodging. The shade coated himself in the fog, which stopped my teleportation attacks from landing. 
Every time the strand of cosmic mana connected, the fog would protect him, and a portion of it would disappear instead before being quickly replenished. Usually against most of the other shades, I did not have such a problem as my cosmic mana could bypass their barriers with ease. This one, however, seemed like a higher level one. Still, a string of hope sparked inside of me as the battle continued. Although I couldn't do much to him, neither could he to me, and as the battle continued I was slowly analyzing how to get past his fog barrier. The space around me darkened even more, and I hastily teleported away behind the monster. This time he was ready and slashed at me with what appeared to be a dark whip of sorts. I twisted my body in a dodge, letting the attack fly overhead before I countered with a dragon breath. The shade swerved, avoiding the attack, and rushed toward me. A slight frown made its way across my face as I teleported away. Come on, we are both just wasting time. Can't you see we are bad matchups for one another? How long have we been at this for? I said, but inwardly my mind was running in overdrive. He dodged my dragon breath. He didn't defend against it using his fog, but dodged it instead. A glimmer of hope made its way to my heart, but I forced myself to remain calm. First I had to be sure. I continued dragging the fight and launching a few cosmic attacks here and there. The shade did the same and even managed to take off a couple more of my scales to my left side. I occasionally launched my dragon breath attacks, here and there, and just as I expected, the shade didn't defend but dodged instead. Seeing that, a plan quickly began to formulate in my mind. My attacks slowly began to turn more frantic. What a waste. Just move from there, damn it. Seeing my anxiety, the shade's aura shook happily. What's wrong, little pillar? Play with me some more. His voice reverberated in my mind, causing my frown to deepen. Inwardly, however, I was calm as I continued with my facade. The battle dance between us continued with me growing more frustrated with each missed attack. The shade didn't say anything more, but I could see his attacks growing bolder and bolder. It didn't take long before I slipped in my frustration. One wrong teleportation and I came face to face with the shade's sharp sword-like attacks. I dodged and diverted as many as I could but inevitably, one strike landed true. I groaned as my stomach was pierced by the attack. The shade moved almost instantly, not giving me a chance to teleport away. The fog surged alongside him as he blocked all the space around me. Panic flickered on my face, and the shade's figure flickered with excitement as his limbs launched toward me. It was then that I instantly coated my limbs with cosmic mana and grabbed hold of the monster's main body. The cosmic mana and the fog clashed against each other and my claws were already slowly melting off but a wicked was plastered on my face as I held on even tighter to the shade. Finally got you. You bastard. The shade seemed to sense that something was trying to retreat, but I wasn't about to let this opportunity go. The pain from my claws and stomach was already making it harder for me to focus, but it was worth it. Panic began to set on the shade as he unleashed the full force of his dark fog. I retaliated by doing the same with my cosmic mana. The two sides clashed causing flashes of purple light to illuminate the dark space. My mouth then opened as a spinning orb of energy materialized before me. The shade growing more anxious roared in my ears and began to swing wildly. The fog turned into all sorts of shapes that bombarded my cosmic mana, and the shade tried to attack me physically as well. Alas, I was holding on to him for dear life. Ignoring the pain coursing through my body, I let my dragon breath grow larger and larger and soon the light was almost blinding, akin to a small star in space. Eat this, you ugly bastard. The dragon breath was released, and the fog parted ways. At first, it tried to fight back, but resistance was futile, and soon the shade was completely engulfed. After a few moments, the fog slowly disappeared. A few more, the shade's energy that was preventing me from healing. Inside my body slowly disappeared. Still, I didn't relax completely, instead, I launched another dragon breath for good measure, before devouring what remained of the shade's body. Power coursed through my body, and a slight shiver of ecstasy passed through me as I lightly smiled. Wait, that wasn't so bad. Quite tasty too. I could get used to this. I inwardly mused before hastily shaking my head. No, no, calm down now, ether. What get used to? I inwardly sighed before turning my gaze toward the direction where the main plane was situated. I was finally almost there. I could even sense the aura emitting from it. 
But first, before any of that, I had to heal my injuries. Cosmic mana flowed through me from our surroundings, and a sigh of relief escaped my mouth. The energy I had absorbed from the shade was extremely helpful as well, and not long after, my scales regenerated and the attack on my stomach closed. Phew. Time to go. Chapter 419. Tourist. Syrah, you're back. A cheerful chorus erupted as Syra and the others approached the distant village. The dragoness chuckled, patting the children who flocked around her. Their curious glances at the newcomers revealed a mix of intimidation and awe, particularly with Enos's towering presence leading the way. Emmy's eyes sparkled with interest, while Essie happily waved at the children who gradually warmed up to her. Before long, she found herself giggling alongside them as they strolled down the road. You're so pretty, exclaimed one of the young girls. Essie's face lit up with a happy, somewhat smug smile. You are cute as well. Meanwhile, Sidis observed the scene with a frown and Brita, walking silently by his side, struggled to maintain her usual neutral expression, revealing subtle cracks in her emotionless facade. Enos, maintaining a serious demeanor, concentrated on not falling down and embarrassing himself in front of his siblings and mortals. Unexpectedly, a young boy with wild brown hair approached him hesitantly. Um? Confused, Enos turned to the puny mortal. Why you look so strong and so big? How can I be as big as you? Is it because you finish eating all your vegetables? My mom said I will grow up to be strong if I eat my vegetables, but I don't think anyone can be as strong as you. The child's eyes shone with awe. Caught off guard, Enos struggled to respond and ended up nodding with a grunt. The child beamed. I'll eat all my vegetables from now on. I want to be like you. Glancing at his siblings for help, Enos felt a bit flustered with the enthusiastic attitude of the little mortal before him. A light cough escaped his mouth before he answered. Good. His voice boomed in reply sending the kid's hair flying and causing the group to suddenly stop and turn toward him in shock. The child's previous expression turned blank in disbelief before his eyes shone as brightly as ever. Whoa, how did you do that? Was that magic? As the children marveled at Enos's unintentional display of strength, a sense of amazement filled the air. Wow, did you hear that? My ears are still ringing. Soon, a strange spectacle unfolded as the group approached the village gates. Enos, now leading alongside Syrah, had two kids on his shoulders and four more in his hands, all laughing wildly. Be careful now, Syrah reminded him, to which he nodded. His stern expression had softened into a satisfied smirk. Mortals are strangely adorable. Enos mused as he continued to indulge in the children's shenanigans creating a heartwarming scene of a strange earth dragon along with young mortal children laughing together. Syra, you're back already? The village guard waved at the old dragoness with a smile. Yes, and this time with company, Syra answered lightly. Sizing them up, the guard looked flustered as he glanced at Emmy and Brita before he turned to look at Syra. Are they mages or knights? You know with the war we can't. Syra waved her hand to stop him and answered, It's okay. They are family. I vouch for them. Saying that, she still tossed him a coin to which the guard expertly snatched at midair. Well then, if you're going so far as to do that, moving out of the way, the guard waved them in with a light smile. Now, children, you go back home first. We have some grown-up things to take care of, okay? Oh, but I want to play with Big Brother some more. Before they could complain even more, Syrah shot them a stern gaze. What did I say about talking about to your elders? A light shiver ran down their spines and the kids hastily replied, Be by Syra. With that, they rapidly dispersed as the group entered the city. What was that? Enos asked. Hmm? Oh, most of their parents work during the day, so I usually help them take care of the children, Syra replied. The guard said something about a war? Emmy asked as she approached. He's talking about the mortal's war, Syra answered. But aren't we still in the borders of the old Paya kingdom? Emmy asked. Oh, I see you know your geography, Cyrus said with a nod of approval. Correct, but ever since your brother destroyed it, no country dared to lay claim to it. So it fell under his new church's control. The area around here is mostly safe, especially with one of his disciples taking up residence in a mountain not so far from here. Halbier, Emmy asked, was that the elf? If so, 
Then yes, him and a large group of his people settled not far from here. They don't bother the villagers, and the villagers don't bother them. Then the war? It's between the other kingdoms, and mostly the mage consequences of the mage purge, which again your brother started. Truly, a troublesome fellow. Brother Ether did a good thing. He helped educate the mortals. Essie jumped in, seemingly unsatisfied with Syrah's answer. The old dragoness chuckled. Yes, yes, I never said he did wrong. Still, the aftermath is there. A lot of mages ran to the old Paya to avoid the hunt. Add to that, some of the knights that deserted, and a few remains of the old kingdom, and you'll see that the mountain range isn't too safe for mortals. Isn't the church handling that? Brita spoke for the first time. Hmm, as far as I know, they are mostly focused on spreading their influence amongst the other kingdoms. The area around the headquarters is safe, for sure, especially with all the disciples, but further away is a no-man land. And why are you living so far away here? Asked Sidis as the group approached a relatively large two-stories high house. Well, like I've said, I've come to grow fond of this place and its people, so the main reason this place exists is because of you, right? Sidis continued. Shrugging, Syrah answered. I help out here and there. I see. He nodded in understanding. Meanwhile, Brita stopped before the house her eyes wandering around the street where dozens of curious eyes glanced at them. There was no malice, mostly curiosity coupled with apprehension. What's wrong, dear? Syrah asked as she was about to open the door. I dash, Brita hesitated before she continued. Am I allowed to be here? Hmm? What do you mean? Everyone turned to look at her, causing her to feel slightly uncomfortable. I'm a goddess. We are not allowed to intervene with mortal matters in the main world. Syria chuckled. Oh. Don't worry about it. You aren't interfering with them. If anything, you are a tourist. A tourist? Chapter 420. Hostility. What the hell is going on? I subconsciously muttered as I stared at the scene before me in disbelief. The main world was up ahead, still quite a distance away, but with my improved eyesight, I could make it out with no problem. It was, after all, hard not to notice the absolute mayhem that was unfolding before it. The space around it was constantly illuminated by all sorts and manners of spells. I could see gigantic figures, some as big as the plane itself, battling with each other. I recognized one of them as the silent dragon my grandfather had awakened before. The scale of the fight was ridiculous, and in the midst of it all was the plane surrounded by all sorts of shields and formations to protect it. It seemed like neither side wished to destroy it, and were both constantly trying to avoid damaging it. This created a strange scene where the immediate area around the plane was empty, almost as if there was an agreement between both sides. Further away was where the battle started to unfold. For a few minutes, I simply stood there stunned as I tried to make sense of what I was looking at. I could see squads of gods fighting in formation against some shades. I could see some dragons backing them up. My eyes were wide in disbelief as I could also see dragons protecting some shades, and vice versa. Magic spells constantly flashed about, and all manners of dead bodies floated about. Dragons, shades, and gods fell by the dozen, but the fight continued to rage on. It was almost impossible for me to tell who was on whose side. Parts of me wanted to rush in and fight against the gods that attacked the dragons, only to stop as a shade would intercept them. The entire battle was chaotic, and I simply did not know how to proceed and so I kept my distance and scanned the battlefield for any familiar figures. Some of the less powerful figures would occasionally slip off from the battle, with a few trying to head back into the main plane. Those who did manage to make it toward the shields and formations protecting the plane were almost always bounced off and unable to enter. Few were able to slip by, but I could see that they had to pay a serious price to do so. Amidst it all, I couldn't help but wonder just what exactly started this entire rebellion. How could some dragon side with the shades? Just the mere thought of them was enough to make my scales tingle in disgust, and here some were risking their lives side by side with them. Why? Should I just teleport directly to the plane? I mused. It was then that I caught a glimpse of a familiar figure. Fighting against multiple shades was a dragon with red burning scales. His entire body was on fire, akin to a meteor as he kept the group attacking him at bay. Grandad! My eyes lit up almost immediately. I wasn't sure what was going on, so the best thing to do in this scenario was to stay by his side, at least until we figured something out. 
I immediately jumped and disappeared from my place, only to reappear right above another fire dragon that was trying to attack Grandfather. This time, I didn't hesitate. My claws grabbed him by the shoulders, and I hurriedly sank my maws into the back of his neck, causing him to freeze almost immediately. Blood splattered as I managed to almost decapitate the dragon in one blow. I followed after it with a dragon breath for good measure, pulverizing his head completely. Grandad's eyes widened as he saw me, but instead of the joy I expected to see on his face, it was horror. Before I could understand what was going on, a sudden shiver ran down my spine as an intense feeling of danger engulfed me. A quick glance at my surroundings was enough for me to almost freeze. The battlefield had come to an almost instantaneous pause, with all eyes turning to look at me. I didn't know who broke the silence first, but their words reverberated in my mind. As clear as day, it's the Void Walker. Get him. It's the Cosmic Pillar. Go. Protect the Void Walker. Whatever happens, don't let them get through. A sudden barrage of orders and cries constantly bombarded me as I scanned my surroundings in shock and confusion. I turned to my grandfather who hastily pushed his assailants aside, earning him a deep wound to his back limb, but he didn't seem to care as he ran to my side. You shouldn't have come, he said as he unleashed his dragon breath capable of destroying an entire planet. This time, however, the opponents were not so easy to deal with. He barely managed to take out a couple of shades and deity before a barrage of shields stopped his attack. A squad of gods pierced the shade formation from behind as they closed in on us. Grandfather didn't spare them a glance as he spoke. Protect him with your lives. The goddess leading them gave a curt nod and raised her trident imbued with divine energy to launch what looked like beams of light to stop the attackers. My scales tingled and I teleported almost immediately, narrowly avoiding a short, black, hooded figure holding a giant sword in their hand. I nervously gulped as a scale fell off my neck. That was too damn close. Can you run away? Grandfather urged, still engaged in battle. My eyes didn't leave the hooded figure as I asked. Run away where? Damn it, anywhere. They are aiming for you. But why? Now is not the time to explain. You have to leave. I didn't get the chance to reply as my eyes widened with the disappearance of the hooded figure. Once again, I trusted my instincts and teleported a short distance away, avoiding another sword strike. This time, however, the second I reappeared, a spear landed true on my side, causing me to groan in pain. I turned to look at my assailant only for another dragon to swallow her whole. Retreat. The dragon's voice echoed in my mind but even he was hit by a spell from behind, sending him tumbling away, his condition unknown. I didn't have any time to remove the spear stuck to my side as I tried to teleport away from the battlefield, but something or someone had locked the space around us making long-distance teleportation impossible. I didn't understand how they did it exactly, but time wasn't on my side. Countless dragons, shades, and deities were trying to get to me, while countless more were dying to defend me. I turned to look at Grandfather one last time before I resolutely teleported away. My destination, the main plane. 